my notes on my, uh, uh, on my iPad. So <laughs> this will be a first for me, so bear with me a second. Okay. So uh, as Preet mentioned, uh, my name is Bill Klosser. I actually am with a company called uh, Nuclear Services Group out of uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, I've been contracted at uh, Idaho National Laboratories for the last 20 months, and we've been looking at um, revolutionizing, or I should say really getting them underway in a reliability and asset management strategy. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, past experience, and we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing um, in the lab today uh, to take a look at moving them forward and trying to integrate them. So, let's see. How many of you are familiar with ISO uh, 55000? Okay. So, um, for those that are, you know that basically 55000, 55001, and 55002 are looking at trying to provide a means for corporations to extend their corporate goals down through to the way we actually manage the assets. But 55,000 is pretty general. It gives us lots of room to work with and leaves plenty of room for us to define things. So, um, you know, the goal being, as I mentioned, getting us from how our corporate goals actually drive how we manage our assets. So the predecessor to 55,000 was PASS 55. Anybody familiar with that one? Okay, that's a BSI standard. Um, and I personally kind of like 55, uh, PASS 55 a little better than uh, ISO uh, 55,000 in part because it gives us a little more detail. It still leaves us out there to take a look at, you know, how are we going to actually develop our own strategies and, managing, and manage our assets. But some of, the things that, some of the things that it does for us is it actually uh, takes a look and breaks us down from corporate strategies into management strategies into, into our individual systems and then it takes a look at the life cycle. And I know Preet showed us a, a six-step um, six uh, life cycle management or life, ci life cycle um, model there. And, um, you know, I've seen five, five blocks, six blocks, four blocks. Past 55 has uh, four blocks. And it, uh, again, I mean, Preet was uh, very good in the fact that she mentioned most of the time that we look at it, we spend in the utilize and maintain, okay? And most of our money, though, is spent in um, the create and acquire portion of that stage. So we really have to think about what are we going to do? You know, we're, we're kind of, once, once the executives get us into... Um, you know, the plants, once they're up, they expect us to operate and maintain those to, with a high level of efficiency and not to be going back to them on a real regular basis asking for modifications or changes because it doesn't work. You know, if we're looking at increasing capacity, increasing throughput, you know, which is a significant extension beyond what was uh, normally envisioned, we can go back and ask for some more. But usually we're stuck, you know, figuring out that strategy to make our equipment as reliable as possible, provide the highest quality of product coming through the plant, and also um, do it as, as inexpensive as possible. So one of the things that... Um, and, and I'm a reliability engineer from way back, but one of the things that we always look at is criticality analysis, okay? And this is a classical criticality analysis uh, process flow, okay? So we look at where we get our inputs from 
you know, a lot of times it's those repetitive failures, it's the high cost items, you know. So we, we start in that arena and we begin to take a look at and um, evaluate how critical is the equipment to um, our organization and our organization meeting its goals. And, you know, this model happens to break us down into five, uh, five distinct, er distinct areas, um, with uh, the lowest one being run to failure. But it also takes us through failure modes effects and analysis, a detailed failure FMEA. Um, and for the top uh, items, the top assets in the criticality analysis, we would be looking at um, very detailed um, very detailed FMEA on each of the individual um, items. Um, in the next rank, what they would suggest is that you group a bunch of like common assets together, and then we do a block analysis for that individual uh, group of, uh, of uh, equipment. The third level would have us looking at, okay, just fall back to OEM recommendations. Um, there are some flaws with that kind of approach, at least in my opinion. And so, you know, as I, we move on here, I'll talk a little bit about those. If you get into doing an FMEA analysis, how many of you have ever done those? Okay. They can be pretty detailed um, and pretty long. And the results a lot of times are dependent on how good is the facilitator uh, at driving the FMEA process. If you're doing them, you're probably hopefully doing them with the team, people with different perspectives on things, engineering, operations, and maintenance. So you're using up a lot of time. So it, you can actually get down and have a very significant number of uh, line items. We actually, um, for one company I did some work for um, a number of years ago, we were looking at, it was a, a large um, seamless pipe manufacturer. And they were actually, um, we were actually analyzing their um, pipe tester, which was the last step. It's their quality assurance um, equipment. And at the very end, you know, we were going through and, and walking through. We actually had um, almost 3,000 lines in the FMEA, okay? And it took us about two and a half months uh, to get through that FMEA. So it can be really long and really time consuming. So um, th that's one of the things that can be a real drawback. I later went and uh, worked for that same company um, at their corporate offices. We were putting together a uh, reliability centered, uh, uh, center of excellence. And uh, we're, I'm gonna talk here in a minute, but we introduced a little bit different way to look at things and a different way to walk us through. We there's actually a software program out that you can that's done a lot of this for you. And when we went through that, you know, everybody sat down and said, you know, if we have to go through the FMEA process this way that we were originally planning on going, you know, it'll take us a long time. And these, the um, streamline processes were a little bit more uh, cost effective. You know, the, the guy that I was working with there looked at it and said, you know, you have no idea how many hours we just cut out. And, the, and he says, because we have no idea how many hours it's going to take us to get through the classical analysis. So, so we started down that journey, and uh, it, it, was, it was pretty good. This is a... Um, simplified execution model. And this is actually the model that we're working to at, um, at INL. And it's one that I use with a, a lot of different uh, uh, clients that I've had over the years. But everything really is, let's see. 
Everything really starts around uh, what I call uh, scoping and the maintenance basis. And scoping is what's, what's going to be in my maintenance strategy, or at least where is it going to fit in my maintenance strategy. Okay? The basis is the compilation of all of my individual equipment maintenance strategies. No, what we're going to rely heavily on coming out of the bases is, you know, it'll drive our, our predictive and condition-based maintenance activities, um, our PM activities, what in my term proactive, which is those precision activities around maintenance, you know, torque specifications, balancing alignment criteria, um, you know, the uh, um, that, those type of things. So, to start for, your, for scoping, we use something called uh, the System and Equipment Reliability Prioritization, something that you'll hear me refer to as SERP, um, uh, the syst that System and Equipment Reliability prior Prioritization is a mouthful, and so it's, e it's much easier just to say SERP. But really what it does is it takes a look at an individual business and says, what are the important things for your business? Whether they be environmental issues, whether they be um, regulatory issues from, in, in this case, DOE drives regulatory requirements for nuclear safety out at INL. Um, there are personnel safety issues which are required to be met. There are mission impact requirements, okay? So we allow the company to try and define uh, what's important to your business. And then we start by ranking uh, the systems that are there. And we, we think of a system as a group of equipment that works together to perform a given function. And we're always looking at system function and equipment function. We come down through uh, looking at the system functions and rank those, and then we divide, we take the lowest portion, we call them out, move them over to the side, and then we go through and we look at the equipment in each of the systems, and we rank those. So the stuff that really comes to the top, that's the stuff that we're going to start looking at strategies for as soon as possible. We did a bunch of work with um, the Federated Electric Power Companies, um, kind of going through in Japan, kind of doing the same thing, um, going through the process. I put this up here because this is really the first time we took the SERP process which, um, and, and married it up with um, something that the Electric Power Research Institute had called the PM Basis Database. Now, PM basis database is really only available to uh, power utilities. But in this case, out at INL, what, we've, what we're looking at and what we looked at with the steel company was a software program called Preventance. And Preventance is basically an outgrowth of the PM basis database. So it provides you a large library of equipment so with the FMEA is already done. So I have a good friend of mine and the, and the first time I saw you know all of these FMEAs already compiled brought, brought back to memory um, I don't know does anybody know Ron Moore? Okay so you know who he is. Well Ron happened to be my first mentor when I went into business for myself. And he looked at me and he says, how many times do we have to do FMEAs? You know, how many times do we have to analyze the same piece of equipment over and over again? You know, and I, I couldn't answer him. I had no idea. I thought that was the way you did things. I was a reliability engineer, right? And so you did FMEAs. But he was right. I mean, Dr. Worlidge, had gone through and compiled all this stuff already, you know. 
So how many times do I have to do it over again? Um, if I look at it, what are the things that change? You know, that was always the first question. What changes? Well, my operating conditions change. I may have a different environment, a, a clean environment, a dry environment, a moist environment, some kind of environmental stressors or none. I have a different duty cycle. You know, I may operate continuously when it's designed to operate intermittently or vice versa. So really, when it, with, with a piece of equipment, once you've, you look at it and all the components and the failure modes associated with the, each of the uh, components within the equipment, all I really need to understand after that is, so what, am I, what environment am I putting it into? And then the stressors apply. Well, if it's already calculated, it's already been done and analyzed, then why would I want to analyze it again? And wouldn't it go faster? So if I go back to the EPRI PM basis database, what the utility executives said at that point in time when they commissioned uh, Dr. Orlands to develop this was, well, we want to go faster. And by the way, you know, we don't have a lot of guys who understand how to do FMEAs, and even the ones that do understand it aren't very consistent at it. So our results won't be consistent. If we take a tool that's been prepared and gone through review, then what happens? We get consistent results and we can get them really, really a lot quicker. So Preventance has a whole compilation of all, these, uh, all, of all the failures. What it provides, and what we're using, what we used at the steel company I was with, and what we're doing here at INL, is we're designing our maintenance strategies for the individual pieces of equipment. And what, what we end up with is, you know, what tasks do you need to perform? How often do you need to perform them based on how important is the equipment? So through the CERT process, we've determined the criticality of the equipment. So we can, we can look at it and assign criticality to the analysis. We can look at the operating environment. We can look at the duty cycle on the equipment. And we can end up calculating or determining the best um, set of maintenance routines, best strategy. So, but a lot of times people are like, well, can't, you know, can't we just shift things? Can we, maybe we don't know how to do this. Maybe we don't have the, a certain technology capability. Um, so, we, Preventance allows you to take a look at and make some adjustments to what you can do. And it actually, you know, when you're looking at the piece of equipment, it may be a motor, or maybe a pump, maybe a coupling, maybe certain things all, all, all together. And it'll allow you to create functional equipment groups and or allow you to take a look at a system and say, I'm taking this system down on a regular basis to do some, some PMs, then why can't I just group them together? And it allows you then to optimize that. You know, do iterate and optimize the, uh, the effort. So <clears throat> you can actually play a lot of games with this, but what, what you see is rather than spending several months to get to a strategy um, on complex pieces of equipment, we're doing it in you know, a day or so. Okay, and then you can get back to, you know, the review cycles and, and the buy-in, okay? And it also, you know, we can take a look at, and this is a case we, we just walked through the other day, was molded case circuit breakers, okay? We have a whole grouping of molded case circuit breakers. And there's been a lot of discussion about how often we ought to do testing on them, whether we even ought to do testing, um, and, and so on and so forth. So we used Preventance to help us do the strategy, but we have something called, um, at, the, at the lab, we have um, AHJs, authorities having jurisdiction, okay? 
And they've actually said, you will do testing, even though we were saying the testing is destructive, you know, and we, we've actually pulled breakers that have overheated because of the way we've tested them and stuff like that. And um, they're not in very good shape. But um, that we'll do that. And we can put the testing back in here, and we've actually annotated that in the, to the comments. We've also run to the, to the extension of the frequency that we're allowed to by the AH, AHJ. And then, you know, the clean and inspect type portions, the cycling, we've tied them and created the sequence so that they all fit together. When we do that, then, we, you know, we, have, we come out with an optimum frequency. And we can, we can look at that optimum frequency and we can look at all the various costs associated with, you know, what's the baseline, what's the, what's the optimum cost for doing the maintenance strategy, and determine are we willing to accept the associated um, uh, availability on the equipment for the cost that's associated with it, for the cost for doing that. So that really, I mean, that really is what, you know, what we're looking at, the things that we're driving towards today um, out at the lab. So I think with that, I'll say thank you.